As a SOC analyst or a forensic analyst, you encounter suspect files. Well, let's be honest, you encounter a lot of suspect files. You also have no shortage of shiny appliances and services to submit these files to, all of which, of course, produce tons of data that you then have to parse through. And then you've got this awesome boss that shows up every few minutes asking you for everything you can possibly tell them about all these files as soon as possible. So I'm going to go over six tips that I think will help you work better in this environment and perform more efficient, more effective malware analysis. Number one, develop realistic goals. I think a great way to do this, very specifically, is to come up with three or four concrete, documented questions that you are going to try and answer as you perform malware analysis. Now, I have four up on here on the screen that I use often. You can create your own. I think this is very helpful in keeping you on track and focused. Speaking of keeping you on track, track your progress. Document your work. This will not only help you tomorrow when you try to continue the work that you started today, but it will help you create that comprehensive final report. Now, there are many ways you could do this. You could use a mind map, a wiki. You could use a dirty napkin, although I don't necessarily condone that. Uh, my opinion, my preference, is to use a Word document. For me, that strikes a good balance between structure and flexibility. Now, here's an excerpt from one of the templates that I use. And whoa, it kind of looks like a process. That's crazy. Um, this is the section on static analysis, which, of course, is when we're analyzing a file without actually executing it. And for this presentation, just for simplicity, I'm going to focus on static analysis techniques. Number three, data reduction. My approach to data reduction when I'm performing malware analysis is fairly straightforward. I take a chunk of data, and then I try to apply a filter to that data, typically in the form of a script, so that I can then run it against my larger data set and hopefully perform more efficient analysis. Let's work with an example. The sample I'm going to use here is from FireEye's APT30 report. This is from a family of malware called Backspace, which is a group of backdoors. Let's take a closer look statically. As part of my static process, my static analysis process, I'm going to extract strings. So on the left-hand side here, you see some of the strings and excerpt that I was able to extract. Now, what you might notice, and granted, it may be hard in the back of the room, but is that there are a bunch of what appear to be Windows API calls here. And that's pretty normal. That's expected, because the import address table within a PE file has dependencies such as functions like these. And so it's expected to see this in the output. However, if I'm going to look at those kind of dependencies, I want to be strategic about it. I'm just going to look at the import address table. So when I look at strings, I don't like seeing all that import address table stuff commingled there. For me, that's just not a very efficient way to look at that string data. So I then created a Python script to basically take the total number of strings and subtract all of the strings in the import table. That includes DLLs as well as the actual functions. And what you get is an excerpt uh, right here uh, that I have on the screen. You'll notice that there are some DLLs here, and suspiciously, there are still some API calls. So what's happening here? Well, you could take a closer look at a code level, and I'm not going to really dive deep into assembly, but what's happening here is that the program is manually trying to determine the address of Create Tool Help 32 snapshot as opposed to letting the Windows loader do that in the background by using the import address table. Now, this function, Create Tool Help 32 snapshot, it's often used by malware to enumerate the processes on a machine. So this is something that I would definitely key in on. So I'm going to call this an indicator of potential badness. When I see an API call that's being used outside of the context of the import address table. I get it, not as sexy as IOCs, but it works for me. Number four, correlate. Binary correlation can be incredibly powerful for two main reasons. One, it prevents you from reverse engineering the same functions over and over again. And two, it helps you create malware families. Let's take an example again. And I do want to mention, there's some pretty sophisticated tools to help you do this at a code level. Ida Pro plugins, for example. We're going to stick with static analysis, and I'm going to show you an approach that you can apply fairly quickly. So these two samples are, again, from the family of uh, backspace malware that are backdoors. Now, we've been extracting strings and the import table, so I'm going to do that again using a Python script. And I also not only extracted that information, but compared them across two files. And if you look at this output right here, you'll notice the script has determined that there are 111 imports in common. And that's a fairly large chunk of the total 122 and 129 that are in each of these files individually. That's interesting. Let's look at the strings. Well, there are only 172 strings in common. However, if you look at the nature of the string, some of them appear to be pretty specific. For example, take a look at this user agent right here. So already, we've generated some pretty solid evidence indicating that these two files might be correlated. And the only reason I was able to really take a closer look at that is by writing the script that allowed me to parse that data effectively. Number five, perform file analysis. 
versus malware analysis. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look at these API calls. Some of them look fairly suspicious. We have registry keys being modified, libraries being loaded, debuggers being checked for. However, all of these are in the import table of known, good, legitimate Windows files. And so the point here is that our suspicions about a file are hypotheses until we prove or disprove them. If you don't take that approach, you might miscategorize a file as malware. And that not only makes you look bad, that makes the file sad. Be nice to files. And lastly, number six, when you're performing malware analysis, there's a lot of data to digest. And so it's extremely important to relax. Here's a quick tip how you can do that. There's a lot of evidence to indicate that the mind works in 60 to 90 minute cycles. So take a stopwatch like the one I'm running against right now, set it for 60, and when it hits zero, walk away. Take a five minute break, take a walk down the street, whatever it takes. Come back and take a look at the problem again. And what I think you'll find is that space is incredibly helpful. I've come up with some of my worst ideas in front of a computer screen and some of my best while getting a breath of fresh air. And if that doesn't help de-stress you, well, you could play a game of bubble soccer, uh, which I just find absolutely hilarious. I have no idea if this is a real sport, but... All right, that's all I got. Thank you so much.